So some of you probably are, which is really cool. So if you have some some friends, some kids, some nieces, nephews, whatever, send them to Bill and I will take care of them. We'll let them have Grange degrees right here from this campus, which is really cool. And so um, uh, I, I'm really excited that we get to talk about virtual fence. Cody and I, we've been talking about it for 20 years or so. It's been, I've been thinking about it for a long time because I just think it's so interesting because I, I built a lot of fence and it's interesting and solitude and you can think a lot, but I don't really enjoy it much. <laughs> so I'm trying, I've been all my life thinking about what could be a solution to this. And since I've been kind of doing this work, I've had more producers um, come up to me and say, man, this is a game changer. I mean, like nothing I've ever done has been called a game changer. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you think so too. But I really hope you'll be critical because we're at the beginning of these ideas and both Cody and I and anyone else working with virtual fence, I think we have a lot to learn. So I'm gonna tell you about the background of technology and then Cody is gonna give you some on the ground uh, what really happens here. So I work with a team of engineers animal physiologists, behavior people, range folks, because this is one problem that cannot be solved with just technology. You have to know the animals and you have to know the land. It's really mixed. So let's go ahead and see what is up here. Is there some reason this is not working? Do I have to use this? Hi, Scott. What do we do? Uh, I'm not nothing, sir. Thank you. All right. Oh, perfect. Sorry. Let's start. 10,000 years ago. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. it, Mr. Technology oh. Guy. Okay. Uh, so livestock have been around about 10,000 years, and we've been trying to control their movement about 10,000 years. Herding, wooden fences, stone fences. So in order to manage where they are and be good at animal husbandry, we've been doing it. It's not a new technology. Uh, the newest innovation in virtual fence, or I mean in fence, happened in the 1800s. 1874, barbed wire came on the scene. And I'm interested that I read an account um, of how they went to the San Antonio Stock Show in the 1800s and showed ranchers that barbed wire would work. They put up a barbed wire fence and they stopped cows. I mean, how interesting. It's all good? Okay, thanks. So anyway, so we don't think of barbed wire as a technology, but at one time it was really an amazing technology. And it was partly because the ranchers as they moved west, they hit the plains, and all of a sudden, there was a huge lack of wood. <laughs> they couldn't build wood fences or rocks. So that was the innovation that came along. Okay, then for those of you who um been around since about the 30s or the 50s and 60s when it became really popular was electric fence. Wow, Gallagher from New Zealand uh, started actually with a car battery to keep the horses from rushing up against his new car. So that was the beginning of electric fence. Again, a new innovation which brings us to today, where the newest kid on the block is virtual fence. Yeah. And we think of it as being really new because the first real articles kind of substantial work was done in the 1990s and 2001 was a really uh, influential year. But um, people have been thinking about it a long time. Let me give you the first, the idea of virtual fence and then I'll talk about some of the kind of steps along the way. One is, so what, what you do is, you have a computer or you somehow draw a map. And I hope you'll show some of those details, Cody. And then uh, the that communicates to a base station and the cows are in the pasture. The cows have a collar or some device on them that communicates with a GPS satellite. So the cow, well, the satellite knows where the cow is. I don't think the cow knows where it is. Uh, well, it probably does, just uh, not geographically. And then that satellite communicates with the, with the information station, the base station. So it's always this communication between the satellite the base station, the cow. The base station knows where the cow is. If the cow comes up against the virtual boundary, the cow gets a warning, sound, and knows it needs to turn around or it's gonna get shocked. Okay, so that's pretty cool. The, the four main people, four main companies on the block these days, Vince is the one that we'll hear about more. They're, they're the first ones that really made it commercially available and they're starting to do big, large range tests. No Fence is a company out of the, out of the British Isles. It's done mostly for sheep and goats, but it works on cows. Gallagher, um, the electric fence company, got into virtual fence. Uh, that should be becoming available in the U.S. fairly soon. And a new company called Corral out of Nebraska. So all different kind of flavors of the same idea. Okay, so why do we want to get rid of fence? Okay, there's a lot of reasons. Karen's reason, like, I don't like building fence. There's fences really expensive. What, ten to $20,000 a mile. So that's another good reason. It's difficult to change, too. 
you, you can't be very um, strategic, like Tip was talking to us about kind of strategic grazing. That's hard to do with a barbed wire fence or a, a net fence. And then uh, wildlife obstruction. How many of you put those reflectors on for sage grass so they don't hit it? And uh, I, I'm sorry how many times I've seen a deer or something uh, snug up in a fence. And then I, also a lot of conflicts. Like, isn't it frustrating when you get the cows where they're supposed to be and then some hunter and or recreationist goes through and doesn't think they should close the gate? Well, what if we could just get rid of that? And then all sorts of other things, weed traps. So there's a lot of reasons to get rid of those big metal fences. Oh, what could we do if we could get rid of some of those? We could sure do rep riparian protection in lots of places that are hard to fence. Uh, targeted grazing um, to get rid of weeds. Uh, to, to get rid of fuels, to manage fuels, such as wildland fuel break here, a Murphy complex picture, probably a really famous picture about the fire came along, hit a pasture and stopped because it had been grazed. What if we could create those kind of breaks with virtual fence? And then of course that intensive grazing management, that, oh, that creative, reflective, dynamic grazing management that we could do, we didn't always have to go out and fix a fence or build a fence. So there's a lot of things that I think conservation values that livestock production, conservationists, almost anyone could enjoy getting rid of fences. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some research that's been going on a while. The actual first studies were done with, uh, have you seen the invisible fence for dogs? You know, they wear a collar and then there's a, there's a line that goes around the, on the yard and it's a radio signal in that um, wire. And so the first studies were done with goats and I know you can say a lot of things about goats, but you can keep goats in a virtual fence. I, uh, some of you may know Ray Holes, who spent uh, quite a long time doing targeted, or, uh, yeah, targeted grazing. He said, he said, it's not hard to make a fence for goats. Heck, if you can make a fence that'll hold water, it'll hold goats. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I think if you can hold goats, that's kind of like the target. And so the virtual fence for dogs worked on cows and goats. So it made us think, well, okay, this could be done. Some of the early studies are pretty small, 10, Heifers kept in for 10 days in a small pasture, 20 cows kept in for 14 days, 20 cattle for 44 days, 30 dairy cows for 10 days. That's the kind of scientific studies that have been done. Two points, one, we're at the beginning, we're starting to think about what is it if you have 100 or 200 cattle out on a really large range. So that's the level we're at now. We're tired of just putting animals in pastures this size. We're going to the real world. The other is, there's never 100% containment. None of these studies ever kept the animals in 100% of the time. I will say that my fence, although it was very beautiful, it never kept the cows in 100% of the time either. <laughs> so there's, there's a problem both ways. Um, and so I think those two things, you're not gonna have 100% containment, but, it's, but it can work. Okay, so here's our one of the first days that we did at the University of Idaho. Um, we've had some bulls, uh, young bulls, 20 or so of them. And uh, we put them in a pen. And uh, their friends were out, put them in groups of three. Their friends were on the outside of the pen, along with the water and the food. So they, they were, I wanted to get out of there. They didn't like it. And the first day, um, about half of them stayed in the pen. And just because when they got near that boundary, they'd get a sound and then they'd get a shock. Uh, some of them tested it, but they stayed in. And then some just totally failed. They just went out. Okay, that was the first day. But then look at the second day. Look at that blue bar. Nearly all of them stayed in the second day. Nearly all the third day, there was a couple of dimwits in there that didn't. And then the fourth day, everybody stayed in. So four days, four days of training. On the fourth day, everybody stayed in. And so we were pretty impressed. And, uh, and it gave us hope that we could go on doing this with cattle. So, Okay, so it's not a life without challenge. Um, I think people that think about virtual fence think, oh, this is just going to be this most amazing thing. I'm just going to, you know, go, uh, Put, put it in the computer and walk away. Well, it's not quite that easy. There are some problems and Cody will tell you about some of those. Uh, one of them is they're, they're all collars right now. And the reason all the systems are collars is because they take a heavy battery. So that's the one place on a cow that can hold a heavy battery. But sometimes they get lost. Sometimes they fall off. Sometimes the animal will lose weight. You put them on, get it all snug, everything's right. And the animal loses weight and it falls off. Sometimes they'll rub it off or shake it off. I've even heard about two animals that got their collars connected and they were just kind of hanging out together for a while. So, so there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Okay, we're at the beginning of technology, they're gonna figure that out. But right now we're still having issues. Um, the other one is that what if you put an, a collar on and then the cow goes out and gains weight, then, then you've got a heavier neck and so that, that could be a problem. 
And then there's some problems with cow, cow, um, cattle failures. I've, I've heard of reports of ranchers who, during the hot season, cows went into the pond, into the, the trap, and got wet and hanging out, and then the collars had failed because they weren't completely waterproof. So we, we're learning. I think the folks on the ground that are doing it are learning, but um, there's, there's issues. Another one that's a little harder to solve is top topography. Virtual fence is really great in rough country because that's hard to fence, but that's also hard to sense radio signals and cell signals from the cow to the base station. So there's some top topographical, and then God forbid you have trees in your pasture because that causes a problem also. Um, and then, although it sounds really great, it's not cheap. The systems we have right now, I, you were going to give some details on the economics. They're not inexpensive. Um, okay, but think outside the box. Uh, that's that's the technology side. So we're going to keep trying to say, how, can, how far can we push the bar? Um, I heard a rancher give a talk on this, and he said that we had two problems. One was system problems, and one was animal problems. <laughs> the system problems were those I just mentioned. These are the animal problems. One thing I'll just put on the table right now, there's no good evidence that these systems cause stress. They've done several stress tests, and the animals don't seem to be stressed by this idea of hearing something and having to go back. So that's good that we're not losing weight or, or any th production from stress. The other is the training hasn't been a problem. We trained those bulls in three days. On the fourth day, they were fine. And, and then you do have to do some training, but it doesn't take weeks. It takes a few days. Um, it, it does take time to implement. So not just the cows have problems, but the ranchers have problems. <laughs> this is not like you just sit down and walk away. Uh, it's time to prepare and install the collars. If you're putting a 200 collars on, that means you got to put 200 animals through the chute. you got to fix them with those on. you got to make sure that the batteries are good and everything. So there's it's quite a bit of investment of getting the collars on animals, learning the computer interface down here on the lower right-hand side. Yeah, if you love computers, um, then maybe this is fun to get up in the morning and have your coffee and uh, re redo your fences, but it's a bit complicated. I've heard from several ranchers saying, there's a, there's a startup time on that computer interface. And then if you, you one cool thing is that you know where the cows are with these virtual fence systems. Uh, again, when I was growing up, my dad would say, Karen, go check the cows. Okay, checking the cows involved 90% of the time finding the cows. Checking them took very little time, right? <laughs> so, but this would save about 90% of the time because that would tell you where they are. But then what if you find out where the cows are and you find out that there's a collar missing or a collar broken? You have to somehow go get that animal, get them in, fix the collar, do something. So it's it's not without time. Um, then as far as the critters, the animal, the cow failures, some cows are untrainable. You know these cows. They, there's about 10% of a herd that really, so far the numbers are about 10% that they're just not untrainable. And you know maybe after generations, we'll start getting animals that know what's going on, but still you, you're gonna have to move some animals maybe to the, to the truck that's going to the, to the market to get rid of them. The other is some can outwit it. They realize that they if they just get shocked a bunch of times, uh, they will run the battery down. And there's been a little bit of report of that, not a lot, but cow, dogs, the dog, um, the invisible fence, dogs learn how to do that. They learn like if they just get shocked a bunch. Um, and then another one is a lot of people have asked me, what if I just um, put the collars on the, uh, the boss cows? would I have to put it on the whole herd? And it turns out that that's really, it's hard on the cows if some animals get shocked and some don't. It's kind of a psychosis, you know, like, oh my gosh, I, 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 why am I getting shocked? Not. And so what they say it happens if you have some animals with a collar and some without, the animals just separate into a couple of herds. Uh, another problem is calves. What do you do with calves? Um, if you're not pressing the cows too hard, like they have plenty of feed, it looks like the calves can go out in the forbidden area and make it back and there's no problem. But if you start pressing the cows, calves go off, the cows get out. So we're learning, but the cat, the animals are not without problem. Okay, so think outside the box, think beyond the fence. What are the future developments? These are the problems I showed you. Here's some things I think we have to look forward to. One, battery technology is improving. Uh, so I think as we get better battery technology, these are gonna become lighter, we're gonna have better ways to put them on. I've even heard people say they're thinking about implanting them right in the animal. I don't know, I think there'll be some internal devices. GPS is improving. When I first started using GPS, uh, plus or minus 50 feet, uh, you know, you, well, that's not very helpful in a, in a virtual fence, but now we're getting within five or 10 feet. 
So that's getting better. Um, the systems, the space station that's in the corner here on the right-hand corner, that's the information base station. Um, so far, they all require cell service, I think. And so if you get up high up on a hill in many places, you can get cell service, but some places you can't. On the other hand, cell service is improving. Unfortunately, you can. it's harder and harder to get away from cell service. Um, and then, oh, although I spelled waves wrong, reconsider radio waves. I, I really have a lot of hope in radio waves. They're, they're less old, old, old technology. It goes a long ways. It's really cheap. And I'm going to tell you about how we're using radio waves at the University of Idaho. So our take on this is let's learn everything we know about virtual fence and let's really simplify it. Could we make a low cost, really durable, really simple system? So we have, first of all, the ear tag. Um, there was a de system designed by the Forest Service actually in the 1990s. There was an ear tag and they kept animals out of a riparian area in Nevada 90% of the time. This was an ear tag. The problem was that the old, the ear tags were heavy. All that the batteries and everything were really heavy. So that was just, they could do it in a trial, but it wasn't going to work. But hey, newer batteries. This is our prototype. We use a two prong tag from, it's called Enduro tag from uh, uh, Australia. They say it lasts 95% of, of an animal's life if you put one in, which would be amazing because you always have animals that lose tags. So we'll see if the two prong, prong, prong works. I don't show it here, but um, if you're going to electrify an animal, you have to have a positive and a negative, right? So you get two prongs. So there, that's built in. So we do the same thing. Animal comes near a boundary, uh, gets a sound, it gets a shock. So uh, just to show you, it works. One of the reasons we started thinking about the ear have you ever hit a cow in the neck? Like they're not, they don't really do much. They just look at you like what, you know? So we, I started thinking like, where would the animal be sensitive? So we did this study where we looked for animal response when we shocked the ear, the neck and the nose. So the neck is half as responsive. It takes twice as much energy to get a response from an animal shocked to the neck than the ear. I really had hope on the nose. I really thought the nose was the thing, but apparently the nose is not, it's not as, nimble even on the inside we put a lot of shocks on different noses and it didn't have any effect but the ear the ear is sensitive okay so why does that matter if you had an area that took half as much energy that would be half as much battery and then also the ear is conveniently located by where an animal hears things so if you make a sound in the ear tag you don't need very much energy for that sound either so our system does not does not use gps because gps is expensive and somewhat unreliable. Ours uses radio waves. I'm sorry, radio waves been around for a long time. I always say that it's kind of cool that radio waves were what how we communicated with satellites that recently left the solar system. Okay, so they can last a long time, go a long ways through all sorts of things. So our system is a very small radio. Uh, you can see this little, it's like the size of my thumbnail, the radio, etc. So I think we're heading the right way. Lightweight. Okay, so that's the technology side. What about, what could you do on the cow side? Like I've often wondered like, how do you tell a cow, hey, you're coming up against the boundary, here it is. And so we've been thinking about sound, sight, or using both of those. Uh, now here's the first study we did. If uh, this, this first set of bars on the left are sound. And so if over four days, if you gave an animal a sound as they approached the boundary, they still failed. Uh, a number of times they failed a bit. If you gave them a boundary, a sight, and you laid a, a piece of, uh, a rope on the ground, they learned a lot faster. Don't go across the rope. Unfortunately, the cows, they got none. I feel sorry for them because they just really got shocked whenever they got near the border. So you have to give animals a cue. You have either sight or sound. The one that we didn't do is sight and sound. And I think that's powerful. If you went outside here and you heard a siren, what would you do? You'd look up. So that's what sound does for us. Sound is a warning, cows are the same. Although I haven't asked a cow lately, I think they're the same that if you heard something, they might look up. And then if you had a, a visual boundary form, that would be nice. So here's my team. Uh, we use students, vandals, go vandals, uh, engineers, ag economists, um, range students, animal scientists. Uh, and we have our low cost tag. And then we also have a really great group of advisors who are telling us, ah, don't do that. Oh yeah, do that. So we've got all the pieces of it. So our first test is to see if we can keep animals out of a riparian area. That would be pretty cool. Even if we could keep them out just part of the time, most of the time. The study in Nevada said that they could keep them out 95% of the time. Again, the difference, we'll talk about economics, but we're shooting for 
beacons that are in the $30 range instead of the $1,000 range, the $30 range, you have to put more of them out. And ear tags that we're trying to get under $20 and we're pretty close to that uh, on the ear tags that they would last. We don't know how long they would last yet, but we're shooting at six months and then maybe a battery change. So that's where we're headed to. And we hope that you'll think beyond the fence. What about cow tracking? That's pretty useful. We got to go there. What about if you could just make a virtual gate or virtual cattle guard for a few bucks, for 20 bucks? Um, water gaps, remember how hard it is to build a fence across the creek? Uh, repairing areas, of course, sensitive areas like roads. I came from Marsing uh, to Bruno Mountain, you know, you've gone that road to get to uh, here. And I didn't hit any cows, but there were cows on the road. What if we could keep the cows off the road nearly all the time? That would be good for the cows, be good for the driver, be good for the rancher. Uh, dangerous areas, and then creep feed. What if you can make a creep feeder with just a virtual fence? So those are just some ideas that as I'm driving across Idaho, I think about. And so if you've got some more, please let me know. And I'm gonna hold for questions because I think most of the questions are gonna come from the real life experiences of you, Cody. <laughs> Again, I'm Cody Martin. I'm the Shoshone Field Manager for the BLM. And uh, being a federal agency, we don't often get to do really cool, exciting, new technology type projects. And so this was pretty cool that we got to participate in this. And how this came to be is uh, there's a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and they're looking for uh, uh, virtual fence projects in areas that had migration corridors, riparian, uh, sage grouse, key habitat. And we happen to have an allotment to check all those boxes, and it's our Davis Mountain allotment, uh, which is up in the Bennett Hills. I'll show you here in a second. And in addition to, to all those, there's, it's just loaded with cultural resources. There's rock out all over the place. There's lots of pretty sensitive stuff up there. And uh, it's probably our most challenging allotment in the Shoshone Field Office, just to the remoteness. Um, it's it, it, it starts down low. It's pretty easy. It's long and skinny, as I'll show you here in a second. Um, and as you move north, it gets to be very, very rocky canyons. And there's really not one good road in the whole allotment so access is very problematic and hard to get to um, we have some fence in there that's divided up into pasture fences but not even all the pasture fences is existence and and i was trying to avoid throwing more fence out there one we couldn't even afford to put it in there we couldn't find anybody to go put it in there and we're just trying to find some other avenues to maybe uh, meet some of the objectives associated with that and so uh, we got lucky and applied for this grant, and we got it. So it was exciting. And as a partnership between uh, National Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we partnered with ISDA. Uh, uh, they're helping us do all the, the monitoring. And and then uh, we've got the permittees is the Cass family out of Bliss, Idaho. They've been great to work with. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know Dalen Cass. He's not the first permittee I would ever guess would come in and volunteer for a project like this. It, they, they've been awesome. Them and their family has been a great partner to work with, and they've been very patient with us. And as you'll see, I've, I've had to run their cows to the corrals numerous times because of this. So the Davis Mountain Allotment is uh, a little over 38,000 acres, uh, public, private, and a little bit of state. It's in between Gooding and Camas County. So in the bottom, uh, so right here is uh, Bliss. This is Gooding. So it runs uh, from here, it's about 20 air miles from the south to the north. And you can see it's long and skinny here. This lower uh, elevation is, is flatter, but it gets pretty rugged, pretty rocky, pretty rough uh, very quickly as you move to the north. Again, we, we use seven pasture restoration system, complex vegetation, uh, access, all that. Um, but did check all the boxes for the migration corridors, sage-grass priority habitat. Um, it's also in unit hunting unit 45, which is one of the um, uh, big game uh, deer elk units uh, in the state. And it uh, provides a lot of the winter range habitat as well in the southern end. So uh, a lot of resources of concern in that area. So this is a three-year project. Uh, this last year is the first year we actually got to implement and put it on the ground. And uh, so uh, the grant, uh, we use the grant money to buy uh, several of these base stations. And then the BLM kicked in uh, additional funds to buy uh, 370 of these collars and the batteries associated with that. Um, again, Cass family, uh, Iowa State Department of Ag, uh, they're helping us with the monitoring and they actually have provided a lot of uh, man hours and women hours to come help uh, put all these things together and swap them out for us as well. So.
Uh, here's the, the cost uh, spreadsheet here. So we use the uh, grant money up there. As you can see, the base stations are pretty expensive. They're $13,000. And actually, I got a really good question yesterday um, is whether or not uh, multiple people could use one base station. I thought that was a great question. I didn't have an answer for that. I assume Vince or something like that can, but, but I would assume they can't. And so if there's various permittees that all went together on one base station, these base stations actually reach a long ways, depending on the topography. Uh, we ended up uh, getting five of them just because uh, we ran the models and we knew it was going to be pretty challenging to address. Uh, and then uh, the callers were about $55 a piece um, for those. So, so it wasn't a cheap endeavor. Um, the objectives, uh, it we were trying to see if we could exclude uh, the livestock out of some of these areas. So we did an assessment and we found that we were not meeting some of the standards, primarily water uh, uh, quality uh, and uh, riparian standards in this allotment. And so we wanted to test and identify the limitations of these of this technology. And to do this, we did some exclosures and then we obviously used uh, this as some pasture fences to try to limit and and uh, curtail some of the use areas in this allotment. So this is an example of the technology that we use with the Vance. And, and I'm not a spokesperson for Vance. They're not paying me to, to advertise for them. It just happens to be the company that was the most prepared and ready to and had all the applications and the programs available to us. And that's why we, we used uh, Vance. So this is an example of the program that the operator uses. And this is what uh, uh, Zach Cash uses. He gets on this computer and you just draw lines where you want it. So uh, one of the reasons we drew lines is one of the southern pastures. Um, and then he would double up areas uh, where there are gates uh, to put that. And that was actually one of the biz biggest successes that I thought we found this year. Something I didn't even think of is that with all the recreational activity that everybody in Idaho is experiencing, all the gates being left open constantly everywhere, um, it was really cool to see that this technology could be used to help uh, minimize that. And I don't think we had a single incident where one of the colored cows actually got out of this boundary, um, whether the gate was closed or not, which is kind of cool and something I didn't expect or even think of. But this is how you kind of draw the lines to keep them where they want. Uh, there's a monitoring plan. So us and ISDA have uh, coordinated some of the collection of the monitoring. Cass family helped us identify some exposures. We want to use, uh, we're going to do uh, some use pattern mapping, some photo points, some stubble height. And uh, because this is just the first year we did it, we're still synthesizing that data. So I don't have anything awesome to show you as far as uh, whether or not uh, the data is showing results or not yet. Uh, it did take a lot of men and, and women hours to uh, put these together. So this was the version one collar assembly. We had an assembly line. Uh, it took a lot of hours to to put them all together because when Vince sent it to us, they just sent us boxes of, of all these straps and weights and belts and batteries. And, and then we had to uh, put it all together. Uh, so this is version one collar. So it's a seat belt like strap. It's got a device, looks just like this. This is the, the component that houses the battery in it. And then on version one, there was two prongs on it, just like a dog shot collar. They both had to be touching the cow in order to receive the stimulus, right? Um, and then there was a counterweight too that went there to keep it from spinning around. And uh, what we did was, um, I was a little bit nervous about just turning them out in spring turnaround because this allotment, we don't have a corral system. We can't uh, gather the cows again if something went wrong. We knew as soon as turnout happens, we're set for the rest of the year, good, better, and different to see what happens. And so what we did uh, was uh, they practiced in the wintertime, this time of year, because they use a lot of corn fields, and corn stalks over by Bliss. And so they put them on all their cows and they started practicing in their feedlot and on the corn fields. And just like Karen said, it only took about three days for the cows to figure it out and start working. And then they could start moving them around these corn fields without even having to go out there. They could divvy it off and, and uh, they were using it uh, that winter. Uh, that's Dale and Cast on the right, and this is uh, when we were putting on version one. Uh, this is what version one looked like uh, when they were on the cow properly. Uh, what we started to experience was this. Uh, they would rub, and it would flip it around, and then those prongs are facing out. They didn't work. 
And pretty soon a lot of them are facing the wrong direction. And like you think we had some other strap failures and some different things. And so uh, uh, before we even turn out in the desert, we had a lot of these that weren't working. And we're like, well, that's not too helpful. So actually Vince, and, and I gotta give Vince credit, uh, they've actually hired uh, a full-time permanent person that actually lives in Wendell and is there to help uh, producers and, and has been helping us all the time, whether it's with the application, the software. Um, in fact, I think they actually have more than one individual now that lives locally um, to help with this. And so they came out and that's where version two came into play. So, so thankfully the cast family was nice enough. We ran all the cast to the shoot again and we, uh, Put on version two, so the Vincent's engineers came up with, and it looked like this. So instead of the two probes, the the positive and negative is each side of the chain. So, and this is like a, we call it the cowbell style. It hangs around their neck, and it's uh, attached to these two plastic pieces up top, so it doesn't uh, go all the way around. And uh, this is what it looks like when they're on. It looks like a cowbell sitting there. And that way that there's no probes that need to be touched. As long as these chains were touching the neck, which they always are at all times, um, it would work. And just like Karen said, uh, you can get in the program, you can pick different buffer distances for whatever you want. And as that cow gets close, it hears a beep. And they start to realize that, that they don't want shocks, so they start turning around the beep. If they get closer and you can change that distance, then they get a stimulus uh, a shock associated with this. So uh, this is what version two looked like. There's some more happy cows with them all on, hanging there. That's what they look like if they get burnt in a fire. Um, that one fell off, and, and uh, we had a fire in that allotment, and it didn't fare too well. Uh, we found it last, last summer. Um, the problem we had with the version 2 was, and we learned later, is that they didn't lock tight these... Uh, bolts on here and so as they swing the one side would slowly uh, come out and literally Loctite would have solved all the problems which they know now um, so they have a version three for next year that, that we're going to be using um, these are all the collars that fell off so one of the failures were we had quite a few that fell off we had around a hundred of the 320 that fell off now it's really cool I know where those are but like I said it's 20 miles north to south and some very rugged so I don't have a crew that I can just send out to pick all these up, but we got a whole bunch of these laying around. Now, some of these reside in Bliss. Some are in Gooding. There's some in Richfield. Uh, hunters have picked these up and taken them home, and, and, and uh, they're all over the place now. And so one of the things that I've asked Vince to do is next year they're going to put a sticker on the back that has a contact number and information. So if someone finds these out here, every time the cast go out there and move cows, they come in with an arm full of these and throw them in the back to pick up and give them back to Vince. Um, but at least people can call and turn them in, and, and Vince can go get them if they if, if people are found in the future. So I know where those are at, but we got to find time to go get them. And I just don't care to have this much trash laying around the, the desert out there. So that's another problem that we kind of came up with that, that we need to resolve and deal with is, is on players. The other thing I've heard is that, like, that's not an easy color to find. No. So so they're going to be like a really bright color. Possibly. So yeah. <laughs> Possibly. You need to have a geo tracking competition. Yeah, there you go. Well, it could be that. Yeah. So, uh, issues. Version one, uh, we did have a handful of batteries that malfunctioned or died. Not that many. It was more so those colors were twisting. And then we had a few buckles failed. Version two worked much, much better, except for the Loctite bolt that eventually worked out and uh, we did have around 100 of those that fell off. Um, the batteries uh, right now and these are only lasting about one grazing season. So you do have to swap those out or get new batteries after one year. And then we also learn, as you'll see, uh, the steep canyons uh, prevent some of the signal uh, to some areas. So in addition to big boxes full of collar parts, we got big boxes full of metal parts that were the towers that we had to learn how to put together. So we had another assembly line uh, where we put all these towers together. This is what they look like. Uh, we put them on the trailers to haul them out there. This is us installing them. There's a solar panel. There's actually a antenna that goes up, and we put some guy wires out. I was confident that these would get shot up in a number of days. Somehow, they've lasted all year. We have not got one vandalized yet. Now, some of them are pretty remote areas. There is one that is not in a very remote area at all. It's right off a beaten path where UTVs go by it daily. 
Um, we put a little sign there saying that it's uh, a part of a National Fish and Wildlife Service study that uh, help improve wildlife habitat, things like that, hoping that um, it wouldn't get shot up. Fortunately, they have not been vandalized yet. Because I said that, there's probably someone shooting one right now. Um, but but they, so far, so good. Uh, they've lasted out there on, on the ground. But uh, uh, as you saw in Karen's video, um, we take them out on little UTV trailers, just put them in the back of the pickup. Um, it, it's nice to have them on a trailer strapped down because then you can move it around. And so you can kind of make these towers portable. So I don't know that you have to have a bunch of these towers if you can move these around. Um, we needed so many because there's so many canyons in this allotment. Um, had we picked a different allotment um, that, that didn't check all the boxes for the grant, so we probably wouldn't have got the grant, but it would have been much easier. We would have had a lot more uh, successes. Um, this technology has worked. Um, there is some very useful applications of it. I'm very optimistic and excited that, that uh, if we could use get some successes in, in our toughest allotment, um, there's some really cool stuff that could be done. Like, like literally one of these towers could cover multitude allotments in some of our flatter country by Shoshone. I mean, I could put one on Notch Butte and cover a, a whole bunch of, of allotments um, and only need one tower. So this is some of the technology and models that, that Vince used to help us identify where to put them. So those uh, yellow dots is where we place the towers. As you can see, right in the heart of the allotment in the middle, there's very little coverage due to the canes. Down here lower, great coverage up in Fairfield where it's flat, great coverage there too. But uh, they've got some pretty cool technology and that they helped us identify where to place those to get the best coverage. The problem that we had was you put them on a high point so they can receive the the cell uh, frequency, and that's how you can change and upload and, and change boundaries. Um, a lot of the issues we're trying to address were down the canyons in the riparian. So next year, we're gonna put one of those towers down in the canyon because it wasn't always reaching the cows or the cows were coming out of the canyon often enough to, to feed the towers. Um, but then you have the problem with the cell phone service doesn't always reach the towers if it's down the bottom. And so, um, you got to balance kind of which one of those you need to meet objectives. But uh, we're going to put a couple of towers down down in the canyons so we have more contact with the cows uh, next year. This is just a, a photo that kind of shows the topography. Uh, it's very rocky. Uh, Canyonlands right there in the bottom. There's actually a couple of cows there that are hard to see. Uh, successes. Obviously, um, partnerships is was a huge success. Uh, ISDA helping us out uh, multiple ways. Uh, Vince has been been great to work with, all the BLM staff and hours that we put in this, and then the Cass family. We couldn't have done this without them. They've been awesome. They ran their cows all through the shoots twice already um, um, to help us with that. The second time we did it was on the worst day of the year. It was blown 50 miles. It was miserable out there. And they were great. They are patient. They've been working with us. Um, um, so you got to have willing and flexible operators. Uh, the technology does work. It does exclude uh, cattle from some areas. Um, and then there's there's some added uh, things for the producers as well. Some of that technology and locations um, is beneficial for the producers as well. So, for example, this allotment, it takes about two hours if you go one way and probably about four if you go the other way to get to, Davis, to the top of Davis Mountain. Um, Zach can pull up his computer and see where all the cows are. And if that saved him one trip up the mountain, that's worth something to him. And so there's some benefits there too, as far as being on the track, know, know where, where their cows are. But Terrain uh, did contribute to some of the success, successes and some of the failures that we experienced this summer. Uh, here's a time-lapse photo. So this is exposure. We put that around a spring source. So this is the very head of a canyon. Spring source is right there in the middle, and uh, it, it gets real narrow and steep uh, to the south from there. And so I took this snapshot of this. This is just one cow. If, if I played the video, it would show hundreds of lines here. But uh, the green dots are every 30 minutes. So that's a ping, every, and you can set that for whatever time interval you want. So there's a ping. So this cow went from here to here, vice versa, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And then you can see where it hit the edge of that exposure. and it, got the signal or was smart enough to hear the beep and it rejected it and, and it went off the other way and didn't go through. When I show you the time-lapse video here in a second, you'll see it looks like there's a lot of cows going through the exposure. What's happened is sometimes uh, 
the the P on this side, and if they come to this side and P, it draws a line straight through it. It doesn't mean the cow walked through the exclosure. It's just connecting the, the two dots. And so uh, now if you want to come play the video, I got two videos. One's going to show the actual uh, GPS movement of the cow, and you'll see as the year progresses how the cow move, cows move through the allotments. Those that did have colors. And then the second one is a model that Vince has. Uh, it's a heat detection model, and I think there's some pretty strong correlations between where you'll see use pattern mapping should reflect uh, some similarities. Yep. It's this way. I know, but I need to oh, get oh, it. Oh, sorry. It's the people online are not seeing it. Yeah, I'm going to keep it here. <laughs> So this is April turnout. So you'll see they all start entering the allotment from the south here. So the line was crossed, as you'll see, when he removes that northern line, it took about two days for the cows to figure it out and move up to the next pasture to the north. So these are the pastures we're getting into that have not any or not very good fence. Uh, along some of those boundaries. So this is the disclosure we have up here in the in the top left. It's kind of fun. You can see some of them start coming back home here in a second. So here they come back, back down along the road. Let me show the heat map. So this is obviously based on the same information, the GPS and some modeling system that they have kind of showing where they spent the most amount of time and for how long. So they're supposed to be in the top left and work into the middle this time of year. So they're supposed to be in this top left one where most of them are now, and then into that one, and then in on the far right one. So for what you said on the, the canyons, part of the problem that 
data is maybe somewhat misleading in those north three pastures because maybe not all the cows they will get picked up. Well, yeah, they, they have to come out of the canyons every now and then to get the signal on where the boundary is. And so that's one of the things that we learned is that if they don't ever come out of the canyons, then they're not getting the signal on where they should be. Um, to, now, what we also learned is that Vince recently told us that you can pre-program the colors for things. You, you don't necessarily have to have the towers. They don't have to ping off the towers. So I think next year we're going to pre-program the collars for some of that information and the disclosures and stuff because that's never going to change and so some some of those uh collars can be pre-programmed such that they don't have to ping or touch the touch the uh uh the towers as frequently question can you overlay that key data in gis and maybe connect it up with some real-time uh information about the vegetation yeah, possibly. So what I would like to do is eventually get some utilization uh, mapping done. And I'm guessing that it's, there's going to be some correlations of where the red spots on that, that map was. Yeah. So are you adjusting the boundary throughout the like, season? So yeah, so so the 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 cast family, he gets on their, that computer and he can adjust the boundary. So he'll turn off some of the pasture boundaries when they're trying to move into the next pasture and then turn on the next ones and, and so he's constantly adjusting the boundaries of each pasture and where we want them to go yeah can you determine if a ping is based on a sap or a sound yes the technology has it'll, it'll show you every course every single cow there's a unique identifier number and you can get a whole spreadsheet of how many times each cow's been a sound or an actual shock and for for how long? So is there a potential for placebo collars, meaning cows that know from sound just need to get the sound and not the zap so you can extend battery life? I think so. I mean, I mean, it's possible, but I think someone would figure it out after after a while if they're not getting the, getting the shock. This is fascinating stuff. Uh -huh. in, in regard to the terrain piece, Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with some of that uh, ground-based technology where they can put like repeater or booster things that would extend the range of what's there. And is that uh, an option for this? So that's, I would assume so, but that'd be more of a Vince question. I, I don't know. Yeah. Anybody else? You guys were easier than yesterday. We had a lot more questions yesterday. You can see some of them got cows going outside the boundary. Mm -hmm. The gas family monitoring that and going out. And yeah. That. Yeah. It helped them figure out where they were. So some of them headed up over towards the Camas Prairie. They actually have some private property up there, too. So those cows knew where that was, but it helped them identify where their cows were and literally what way to go to go try to try to find them. Mm -hmm. yeah. When they go out. Cross the line back. So they call it a one-way gate, is what they call it. So as they're getting closer, they get the the sound, then they get the shock, and then they get shocked. Uh, I think it is three times once they're past that boundary, and then then they don't keep getting shocked, and then they're fine, and they don't get any shock coming back through. So they can come back through across that imaginary line, and then it resets, and then and then they're they're good again. So they call it a one-way gate. So that's the terminology that the Vince Company. Diode. What's that? That's a diode. <laughs> hey, Cody. Yes. Yeah, this is Steve. Hey, uh, just curious, is this being done anywhere else in Idaho yet? So I don't know about Idaho, but I know for a fact they're doing it in Colorado, uh, Montana. So the Vince Company has quite a few of these projects all over the, the West, well, probably all over the U.S. would be my guess. But but I know for a fact there's some being done in Colorado and uh, several in Montana that, that, they're, that they're doing these. And then yeah. have you gotten a sense from them as to how things are going, you know, in terms of buffing out the, the collar, the GPS collar and whatnot? Yeah, I'd, I know that I think they've all went to the version two collars because they had the same failures that we did with the version ones. So I'm pretty sure that they've swapped out all the collars um, to, to a different version. But I, I don't know about the successes or failures other than that. I, I've honestly personally never talked to them. 
Eric, you said there's some in salmon too. One start in salmon. One start in salmon as well. Well, I know. Uh, yeah, Jay Smith is very interested in trying it up um, in the aftermath of the Moose Fire because um, they have a challenging allotment in that Diamond Moose country, and uh, they're hoping that they might be able to put up a tower and and do some of that up there. So I'm being told that that's that's the permittee, and that's where one of these projects is either going to be or is it's next year. Next year, so so next year there is going to be a, a project up there. Anyway, we've got this on our slate to do uh do a piece for Life on the Range this coming year. So look forward to working with you on that. You bet, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I was also going to say NRCS is funding Okay, those that couldn't hear, he said NRCS is funding a Vince project on private property. Where was it? At, in, in Idaho Falls as well. So, so the, the, they're popping up more and more all, all over the place. Okay, thank you.